is run as a preschool and I'm licensed as a large family childcare. So I've been in this business for about 13 years. So what we're gonna be talking today is about building a strong policy handbook in your childcare um, or your home-based preschool. And policies are super important before you, the most important thing to remember is that policies will adjust over time. At start off the first, the, early on in my career, I had a handbook that was only about two to three pages and it has grown to about 12 pages. It was 15 and I took it up and down and up and down, but they will evolve and change over time. So I already did about me, sorry about this and what we're going to cover. Um, this is an important part. I wanna thank Playground for putting together this webinar and Jessica for creating this ultimate guide for writing a policy handbook. It's 70 pages and there's so much information in this. So scan the QR code and check this out. There's going to be plenty of things that I skip or forget to mention, but it's in this handout. So you don't have to worry about writing a bunch of notes down. Everything everything is, is here. And I think um, if they miss this scan, could it be emailed or downloaded elsewhere on the website? Yep, this will be available in the email on our website in many places for people to access. Okay, great, fantastic. All right, so the beginning of your handbook should be an introduction to yourself and it should include all of your experience uh, working with children, your qualifications, your training. You should also include everything that licensing requires you to do, uh, first aid, CPR, any other trainings required by licensing, any classes you've taken, but any kind of experience that you may have. Your philosophy on childcare and your parenting style, those are also very important to put in your introduction and philosophy. I like to include any pets on pre premises or also other children and family members that live in your home, other employees that may be working with you, any co-teachers or any assistants, they should be mentioned in this section as well. After that, we can get right into the policies. Uh, the first policy that I go over is snacks and meals. This is important. Many of us are on the food program which provides reimbursement for feeding the children, but some people prefer that children bring their lunch from home. Uh, a lot of the policies I'm gonna talk about are my own and everyone has their own policy. So perhaps you do not wanna be a part of the food program and you want children to bring their own lunch. For me, I thought it was easier for all children to be fed the same thing and it to be consistent and it worked better for me. Under your meals and snacks, you really want to put in when you will be serving these meals. So, and meal cutoff times. For example, if a child arrives at 8.15 and they say, oh, you know, Johnny hasn't had breakfast, go ahead and feed him, but you've already put everything away. You wanna make that clear upfront that there will be no other food served till, you know, 9.30 when AM snack is served. That way, you know, there's no misunderstandings. Everything is written down and documented and everyone understands because you can't start serving another breakfast after everything's been put away. Supplies. Uh, some people prefer children to bring a bag with supplies every single day or supplies kept there. For me, I prefer all supplies to be kept on premises. I have cubbies for each child and they just bring the child, no diaper bags, no book bags, nothing like that. Some providers provide diapers or wipes because they they prefer a certain brand. Um, I do not provide any of that, uh, but I do provide my own water bottles because I like a certain kind and um, I, I supply nap supplies too, but we'll talk about that in a separate section. So, uh, let's see, restricted items. This one's important. This is where I put in toys. It's toys should, in my opinion, never be brought to daycare or preschool because children are not developmentally capable of sharing their personal items uh, at this age. It just causes too much, too much distraction and also responsibility that you might break something. 
I also don't allow umbrellas. For example, if it's raining and four kids come with an umbrella and the other ones don't have it and they become swords and weapons and no umbrellas allowed. So that's some of my restricted items, toys from home um, and umbrellas. Illness and injury. In your illness and injury section, you should have a list of symptoms that are required to keep a child at home. For this section, I would go to the CDC website at, or your licensing website and see, they usually have a handout of what is and is not allowed in daycare as far as illness goes. Um, the basic ones, obvious, diarrhea, vomiting, throwing up, uh, you know, eye infections, lice, any of those things. And temperature threshold. My personal temperature threshold is 100.5. That used to be 101 before COVID, but I upped it to 100.5. Um, also the 24 hour rule, this, this goes over a couple of things. For example, if a child, if your child is sent home with a fever or any of the symptoms in the list of symptoms, they cannot come back the next day. They need to be out for 24 hours symptom free. Uh, some people during COVID went up to 48 hours symptom free, which is really hard to do, but you know, trying to keep illnesses at bay. The 24 hour rule also applies to medications. Um, I like to tell parents if their child is prescribed an antibiotic, they need to stay home until they're on that antibiotic for a full 24 hours. If they're in the hospital, if they have an injury, a broken arm, or urgent care, any sort of doctor or hospital stay, they need to stay home for a full 24 hours for observation. After that, I feel like it's safety for liability for us to have that 24 hour rule. Immunizations. Immunizations vary from what is required by state. So the first step is to figure out what the regulations are in your state. Um, in California, we, we, we have to have all immunizations to be enrolled in daycare. Some, you're allowed to accept it if you choose a doctor's note, uh, but you need to call your licensor and make sure that that is acceptable. Um, I haven't had to deal with that, but um, if someone has a legitimate reason, that can be accepted, I believe, it depends. So you need to contact your licensor to get the definitive on that. Updates, this one's huge if you take infants. When infants start with you, maybe they've had just one or two shots, they're a newborn. In the first year of life, they have immunizations every two to three months. So you need to have it in your handbook of policies that parents bring you a printout from the doctor's office every single time the child has immunizations. That way you can update your records. We, we could be fined if, you do, if children are not up, completely updated on immunizations. I have overage too, so I don't have that issue as much, but when I had infants, it was very important that they always brought updated forms, printouts from the doctor's office. Staying home after immunizations. This is another one of those policies that came out of necessity. A lot of my policies came out of necessity. Something comes up and you realize, oh, this is a problem for me. I need to make a policy about it. Uh, when I had infants, they would be very, very fussy after immunizations and in pain and maybe a fever and maybe diarrhea, just miserable. And they need to be held and loved. And when I'm caring for six or more children, that's difficult to do. So I felt like infants should stay home for a full 24 hours after immunizations just to get that extra love and also observation, you know, looking for any type of um, reaction that could happen. So it was also a liability for me. Um, some parents can't do that. So I put in the policies that you should schedule immunizations on a Friday so that you have the whole weekend to stay home and observe your child and give them all the extra love and attention they need after immunizations, especially the four and six month immunizations. They can be really bombed One out thing I'm gonna add on this talk about immunizations also is that uh, through the Playground app, you're able to store all your immunization paperwork, dates, all the you know all the information you need surrounding this um, and keep it digital. So it's really easy to organize um, 
kind of works in conjunction with your policies, you know? Yes, 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 exactly. No, that's very important because keeping track of immunizations is difficult and making sure you have all of them is, is hard to do. So the app actually is very, very helpful with that. Okay, nap time. This is one of the biggest things that I see talked about in group childcare, Facebook groups and uh, different posts. My, when I first started, I didn't have a policy on nap at all. I had parents coming in and telling me their two-year-old, they don't want their two-year-old to nap or they want their two-year-old only nap 30 minutes and they want me to wake them up. So I just went along with whatever the parents said at that time. But after years and years, I realized that nap is one of the most important things for a child care provider. We really need that time for our sanity. And it's crucial for our mental health to have a little bit of a downtime and a quiet time. So in my program, all children are required to nap or lay quietly for a certain amount of time, regardless of age. My five-year-olds are napping. I my preschools down the hall and my assistants with them and they're all napping as we speak. And I have several kids ages three to five. If parents do not want their children to nap, I tell them that they can find a different program because that is my requirement. Pickups during nap. Uh, I do not allow anyone to be picked up during that time uh, unless it's an emergency or a doctor's appointment or something like that. What I mean is like on a regular basis, if someone came to me and wanted to pick up their child every day at two o'clock, that wouldn't work for my program because that's right in the middle of nap. Um, if you want to pick up your child and you need to pick up your child, of course you can. Uh, but I ask that they you know, text me or call me and we bring the child out to them. That way the parent isn't coming in and waking up all of the rest of the children and disturbing nap time. Um, in the nap section of your handbook, it's important to talk about the regulations regarding children's personal rights. You know, We can't make them sleep and we can't make them stay awake. And we can't wake them up. That's another thing. Parents want you to wake their child after a certain amount of time. That goes against the child's personal rights. You know, they need to be sleeping and we are not allowed to just wake them up after 30 minutes because the parent wants us to. Nap cots, sheets, pillows, pack and plays, all of those things should be included in your policy. Do you provide them yourself or do you require parents to bring them? I've always provided that myself. That way I knew I had it, even sheets, blankets, everything, unless they have a special blanket or something from home they would like to bring, they're allowed to do that. But I also wash them myself. Some providers like to send everything home on a Friday and have the parents wash it. But for me, uh, I, I didn't, I wanted to take that burden off the parents. So I do that myself. And that way I know it's always ready and clean on Monday morning for the following day and parents, if they forgot it, it's not a problem. Uh, infant nap, nap regulations. I'll go more over this in the infant section, but uh, you know, there's a lot of new rules regarding in infants. So that should be included in your policy. Some parents don't know these policies. Uh, for example, the safe sleep practices. We must follow safe sleep practices. I've had parents, when I took infants, bring a baby and tell me the child only sleeps on their tummy. It's the only way they've already slept. And it's a two or three month old baby. We are not allowed to let them sleep on their tummy. It's, it's, it doesn't follow safe sleep practices. And if we do that, even if the parent says that, we could, we could get in trouble with licensing and we must follow licensing regulations. So it's important to tell parents that so they know um, that we follow safe sleep practices. Also, some newborns maybe only sleep in a swaddle, we're not allowed to swaddle, or parents prefer blankets and pillows. We can have nothing in the crib but the infant. And uh, pacifiers are allowed in California, but none of the strings that attach them to the baby. But parents need to know all of these things that we are responsible for so they can be on the same page with us. Um, we also have in California, nap logs and 15 minute checks. I don't know if other states are requiring that, but infants under 24 months must be checked on with breathing and noted on paper every 15 minutes during, during their nap. Um, yeah, so there's, oh, there's a infant form that I have that I'll talk about in another slide that has a lot more information on this sort of thing. Here we go, infants. Yeah, so we went over sleep, sleep practices and the licensing regulations. Feeding, um, 
it's important to let parents know what you require. Uh, do you want, some providers want all fresh defrosted breast milk in bottles ready to go. When I took infants, I preferred them to give me several bottles and a bunch of frozen milk in the freezer and I will deal with it, use it as needed. Um, so, some, this is a huge one to me because some parents want you to give you only a very small amount of breast milk and say, hold the infant off until I can nurse them when I pick them up at 4.30. For me personally, I was not willing to do that. I'm not going to keep a hungry baby past the three, four hour mark where they haven't eaten just because I'm holding them off for a parent to nurse after work. I had to have plenty of breast milk or formula or both in order to care for an infant because I just did not want to do that to a baby. I was not comfortable doing that. I made a form called acclamation to daycare. It's preparing infants for our daycare document. I found that a lot of infant parents want us to be nannies and you can't do that when you're caring for, you know, five, six other children. So I think is the form might be linked. And do you know if that, the preparing infants for daycare document it is it's in the, um, it's in the handbook. So, um, okay, perfect. for those of you who just joined and didn't get that QR code, we will be sending the handbook out, um, after the, the, um, webinar. So people will have it, but it's in there. Okay, perfect. I just wanted infants to be prepared for the childcare experience because it's, it's different than having just one parent and, um, it's different than a nanny because there are other children that need care as well. So there's a lot of information on there that you can put in your policies for infants. Clothing. This one is big to me. Uh, fancy clothes. I ask that all children come in play clothes, something they can get dirty in. You know, we're getting dirty, we're getting messy, and we're having fun. If you want to wear your fancy dress, fine, but it may get ruined and I'm not responsible for that. That needs to be in your policies that you prefer them to wear easy, uh, you know, just play clothes, nothing too fancy because it may get ruined with whatever we are doing that day. Difficult clothes. Uh, I This policy for me came up with a nece through necessity. Uh, I had children and we were potty training coming in overalls or jumpsuits or things like that that are impossible for them to use the bathroom on their own or you know tight tight skinny jeans with buttons and zips and I'm busy with another child so I require all children to wear easy clothing you know nowadays luckily most little girls wear leggings and shirts and everything's pretty easy to pull up and down on your own but I do not want them wearing overalls or anything like that Oh, another thing that's in my policies is for little girls to wear shorts underneath dresses because um, I find that little girls love to lay on their back with their legs in the air and go on flips on the bars and everything. And it's just more appropriate for them to just wear a little pair of shorts underneath their dresses. Um, shoes, for me, I require a closed toed shoes and socks. I do not allow flip-flops. Sandals, things like that on water play days are fine. I also do not allow tie shoes. I do not have time to be tying shoes all day long and children trip and fall and get hurt and tie shoes are nothing but a problem. I used to work in a kindergarten class that did not allow tie shoes and I thought that was a great idea because teachers don't have time to be tying shoes all day. Uh, jewelry. I also don't allow jewelry. I think it's dangerous. A child's necklace can be caught on a bike or a swing or another child pulling it. Um, you know, pierced stud earrings are fine. Um, amber teething necklaces, things like that. I stopped allowing those several years ago because of liability. I think it's dangerous. Um, winter gear, uh, in California, we don't have to worry about this, but in other states, they might require full snow gear to be able to go out and play. Uh, during recess. So that's another thing. Uh, or even summer gear in the summer, you might require each child to leave a bathing suit at your program because on the spare of the moment, you could decide you want to do water play. So to have a policy on that is 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 nice. Potty training. Um, potty training, you want to use whatever level of involvement you are comfortable with. Some providers want nothing to do with it at all and require kids to wear pull-ups. 
you know, until they are accident free for quite a while. Um, in my program, most children are potty trained. We usually have one or two out of 12 that are not, and they become potty trained very quickly because we don't mind being involved in that. We prefer all children to be, pot to be potty trained, and they're usually potty trained. Within a month of arriving in my program, we go straight to underwear. I don't do pull-ups. We have a couple accidents. It's fine with me, and I tell parents that in our in my in my program. So it, it's just your level of involvement, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, I like to tell parents they should start it on a weekend or a long weekend and make sure the child is able to be in underwear for a couple of days, accident free before they bring them in underwear to school, but we do, we are very supportive of potty training in my program. <clears throat> Tuition, that's a big part of your policies. Uh, you should have your rates or a, uh, a link to different rates you have for different programs, um, ways to pay. Uh, we are now being pay paying all through the Playground app, but um, if you don't have Playground yet, you can you can accept checks or Zelle or Venmo. Um, I was all electronic. I've been all electronic for about uh, two years now. I haven't had checks in, in quite a while, and it's it's much much easier for me to be electronic. Um, you should have the due dates if some if you like to be paid monthly or weekly before. Some providers like to be paid you know the Friday before for the week, whatever your policy is on that. Um, late fees, how much you charge past a certain hour. If there's a grace period, I have a five minute occasional grace period. And my fee is going up to $3 a minute um, this fall, which is kind of a lot, but you know, you charge it a couple of times and they learn really quickly to not be late. That's another thing I like about the Playground app is I don't have to, I won't have to charge the parents if they scan the child out you know, five, six minutes late, uh, an automatic fee can be charged. I don't have to tell them that they will be being charged a fee. So that's going to help a lot this school year for me. Um, paid regardless of attendance. That's crucial. I like to explain it to parents as it's like a gym membership or a private school. When you're, when you're gone, you're, you're still paying for your spot. When you go on rent, you still when you go on vacation, you still have to pay rent on your house. It's still sitting there waiting for you. Um, your spot in child care is just like that. So you pay regardless of attendance. Uh, many people do not like to hold spots. That's you know, it, it can get expensive for us. So I char I'll hold a spot for two weeks before I start charging uh, a fee. And then after that, I charge 50% fee until they take the spot for a max of six weeks. I believe it says in my policies, um, because you know we can't just let that spot hang open for for six months unless you want to. That's you know your personal policy. Uh, two week trial period. This one is huge. So anytime within the first two weeks, the contract can be broken by either party because maybe it's not going to work out. You, you don't know. Um, it takes a full two weeks for a child to get acclimated into a program. So I like to let them know that the first two weeks is a trial period and the contract can be voided anytime during that time. Um, vacation, holidays, and sick, just like I said in the previous slide, you pay regardless. Some providers will allow uh, their families maybe one or two weeks of unpaid time or 50% off for vacation. Me personally, I do not. Um, it is all paid 100%, except for I do allow teachers to have the summers at 50% rate to hold the spot. Um, but all holidays are paid in full. I take 10 days vacation paid in full. Sick days, I have five sick days that I could use, sick or personal days, and those are also 100% paid. Um, some providers are not comfortable with that. And I didn't at the beginning, it was really, this was something that was very hard for me uh, my first couple of years to require everyone to pay. But now it's not even a question. No one even bats an eye. And I take a week off at Christmas and a week off at summer, all holidays. And sometimes I don't use all my sick days. Mostly I don't, um, but sometimes, sometimes I do. Teachers, I require them to pay full rate for Christmas break, winter break, fall break, spring break. Any breaks they have during the school year is 100% tuition paid. I only allow them to have 50% off 
in the summer, which allows me to start some new kids early and, and works out. You, okay, some providers like to have, I'm open at you know 7 a.m. and I'm closed at five or contracted hours. Contracted hours is something new that many providers are doing. That way, you know when kids are coming and going and it's not just a free for all open schedule of coming. Um, I prefer to only be open when I was full time and took infants to whatever the parents' working hours were. So that that worked out for me. I did not have an open schedule. Um, that way you can you know have your late fees and everything like that. Uh, cutoff time. I used to let children come at any time, and then over time, and uh, I decided that didn't work for me as well. So. Now, after 1030, you may not come if you are going to be that late. 10, 10 o'clock, uh, even for some doctor's appointments, uh, it's just too late. I, I Sometimes I'll make an exception to that, but you know, our day is practically over by 11 a.m. We start lunch and it's 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 too late. So you have to decide if you have a cutting cutoff time that that you want for your program. Um, I don't know how much time we have left. If I'm going too fast, not fast enough. Um, no, well, you're you're doing perfect. Um, okay. We have a question. If you want to take a quick pause and answer that question, yeah, sure. Let me get answered live from Stephanie. Um, the question is, and let me know if you can see it. Do you, do you review your parent handbook during the interview tour? I've always used my contract that has a lot of this, but I'm wanting to switch to a parent handbook slash program policies. You know, I like to send it to them ahead of time or um i give it to them on the first day and tell them you know read over this this has all my policies after you read this you can text me call me with any questions you have it just lays everything out but before they enroll i require them to read read the whole thing i don't sit down and go over each thing with them i answer any questions they have but i prefer them to take the, the handbook home and read it themselves uh, that's and I'll, I'll add on there that also through Playground's app and software, you're able to upload your handbooks onto Playground and make it required to collect signatures um, and kind of approval on those handbooks before you enroll in new families. Yes. So it I'm just moving to all digital. Book. It's so expensive to hand these handbooks out to every parent. Dig Digital's going to the way to go because, you know, it gets expensive if you're handing one of these out to every single person who comes, but you want them to know it. So um, yeah, digital. You can save this also like, through your playground app to make it available at any moment in time. So if anyone ever asks a question saying, hey, I know about that, you can say, just look at the, the handbook inside the playground app, it's available. And I do tell them that I modify and edit a handbook every single year because things change and things come up and you may add a new policy of, of something that you know didn't work for you that particular year. So and I know. Says the previously we had spoken a bit about the difference between the contract and a policy handbook. Um, yes, that's important because contracts should be monetary only. When I first started, I had a three page uh, contract that had policies in it as well. And then I realized they needed to be separate. Um, yeah, contracts should just be, you know, your tuition and all of the monetary agreements. You can have a couple crucial uh, policies there, but a contract should basically be one page. Mine's, I think, yeah, mine's one, one page, one-sided now. Um, that way you just get right to the point on that. But you should also have a signature page of your handbook with bullet points of your most important um, policies. That's something new that I, that I created. Well, thank you very much. And yeah, please keep going. Okay, family communication. I do a monthly newsletter, um, but it's, you know, uh, the, the Playground app is a wonderful way to communicate to all of your families all at the same time. I previously did a uh, Facebook group, but I'm finding that a lot of my families are going away from Facebook, so that's not working anymore. So Playground's solving that problem for me, where I know that now I can have a place to communicate um, with my families. Transportation. I used to transport a lot more. I don't as much anymore. Um, so you tell parents in this section what your what your plan is. Some providers like to run errands or uh, go to the park or go on field trips all the time. You know, I always ask that they always sign a permission form because I wanted to have that flexibility to leave with the children if I needed to. 
Um, now I don't leave as much, but I have an opt out form if if you do not want your child to go on field trips, if we do go on field trips, you can keep them home that day, but you still have to, you know, pay regular tuition, but you may not come if you do not want your child to attend the field trip, there will not be alternative care. Parent volunteers, um, now that my program is more of a preschool, I have a lot more parents wanting to come and volunteer, which is fantastic. But I state in the handbook that when they are there on a field trip with us, they are responsible for their child because children will not listen to a teacher if their mother is there. So I make it very clear that when they are there, they are responsible for their child. Car seats, um, I provided car seats when I, um, when I do transportation and field trips, but you can, you know, require car seats to be provided by families if you choose. Um, discipline, this is important. Uh, I, in the past, I had parents tell me it was okay to use corporal punishment on, on their child. It hasn't happened in years, but I absolutely made it very clear that is not going to happen. There will be, you know, no corporal punishment, no verbal punishment, nothing like that. And um, do not even request that because that is not something that's happening in a licensed child care. Uh, my, my discipline routine fo focuses on prevention and redirection and consistency. And sometimes we use timeouts, rarely anymore. I have a quiet corner where the child can go. A lot of times we'll put a toy on timeout. If a toy is causing a big problem, the toy will go on timeout and be out of rotation for a while. And that usually, usually helps. Um, I have a duplicate form I bought at Lakeshore. If there is a you know extreme discipline issue or anything, I can write it down on that form and keep the other copy uh, so that I can keep track of um, extreme discipline situations. I haven't had anything like that in a while, but it does happen. Uh, such as biting. Uh, biting is more normal under age two, but once you get over two, it's a little more of a problem. Um, for me, if a parent is being supportive, if a child, a lot of children who bite have speech delays, I've found. And if a parent is trying to, you know, get speech, see, tell the doctor, being proactive, I'm a little more on board with helping understand and, you know, shadow the child and redirect. If it's constant and the child is causing, you know, broken skin, and repetitive, your policy should protect the victim. And if other parents are upset that their child is being bitten, I, by the third bite, I would terminate the child who is continuing to bite because you must protect the other children. Biting's tough because it can be normal when they're little, but it can also be dangerous and make the other parents pretty upset. TVs and iPads. Um, some programs are screen free, some are not. Uh, we have occasional TV time. It's rare early in the morning um, when there's one teacher and only a couple of kids in our early care. Sometimes we use screen time. Um, on rainy days, we may watch a movie, uh, iPads, things like that. Sometimes I use I used to use them in tech rotations, but now I feel like kids spend too much time on iPads, so we don't really use iPads at all in my program, but you need, if you do, you need to let parents know that if parent wants a completely screen-free program and you, you do use a little bit of TV, maybe it's not the right program for them, but we, we do, we, on rainy days, sometimes we're watching a movie and I make that clear and that's okay. Photography and social media. I have a photo release form that all my parents um, sign. I haven't had a parent that didn't allow this when I first started about 10 years ago, I did. And you can, you know, still post the pictures and put, you know, something over their face, a sticker or something like that. Um, I post on social media and every parent that I have, they love it and they, they don't mind at all. Um, but you got to be careful with this one because, you know, these are people's children. So um, also what you want to tell them is, are you allowed to you know, put them in your group chat or even on the playground app. Maybe they don't want other people seeing their child. So if I had a parent that was really strict about that, they didn't want a group picture being put publicly even on the app, I probably wouldn't accept that child because that would be very challenging. And it wasn't one thing you could do. I mean, yeah, it's a bit more work, but you can select which parents receive the photos on the app. So if you yes. only want, you know, one classroom pair, like if it's a photo of the whole classroom, you can send it to the whole classroom. 
It's photo of just one child being swimming with just that child's parents. Yes, yes, yes. So that's that that's that's what but if, if it's a group picture, you know, then you have to, you know, do different there are there are ways around it with stickers and things that you can put over the child's face. Definitely. Okay, pandemic. This was a, a, a big one not too long ago. Um my during the pandemic for me, we were closed for I was only closed for six weeks and most of my parents kept paying full tuition. I asked that they paid half, but most continue to pay the full thing. We didn't know. We thought we were going to be closed for two weeks. It ended up being about six. Some parents didn't come back for six months, but continued to pay, which worked out well for me. I lost two families, but everyone else kind of stayed around and wanted to keep their spot. So my my policy now is if we are closed for some sort of earthquake or something like that, um, after the first week, I will charge a half rate to hold the spot. But if it's, you know, going to be longer than six weeks, something huge happens, obviously, um, then there's no fee in that case. So I just want people to know up front, this is what we're doing. You can give your two weeks notice at that time and just pay for two weeks. But you know it's hard for us because this is our our income, and it it's difficult if something like this happens happens to us. So it's important to make that very clear from the get go. Termination, uh, the two week notice we talked about that immediate termination. You should always uh, allow yourself to have immediate termination if necessary, and a list of reasons why that would be would need to occur. Um, in the book that Jessica made, it goes over more in detail about that and a list of reasons why you would terminate immediately. Um, okay, some more policies. These are some uh, policies that I added recently to my handbook. Um, I hadn't had any custody or separated parents. That's an important thing to include. Um, utility outage in some Places that are very, very cold or very, very hot, you might not be able to operate without electricity. It might be too cold or too hot. Um, so you'd have to close. Um, birthdays and holidays. Do you allow them to bring snacks for their birthdays? Do you celebrate holidays? My program is very holiday heavy. So I like to let parents know that up front that we do celebrate um, holidays. It's very secular, but we do have Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and all of those things. So let parents know. Sunscreen, um, in California, we have to have a form signed that you're allowed to put sunscreen on children. So it's important to have that in there. And if they have a specific kind of sunscreen they need to use, we share sunscreen in my program unless you have a allergy or something like that. Bereavement, this is something new I added. Um, I believe the uh, handbook that is in handed out will go over more detail on that. I think I allowed myself two to three days of paid bereavement if an immediate family member, if something happens to a, an immediate family member. Parent involvement. Uh, I love when parents get involved with their job. Firefighter comes over with a fire truck. I had a, a parent who was a veterinarian come one time. Another new thing I add is mandated reporter. We are mandated reporters. I think we should tell parents that and let them know that we are required by law to, uh, you know, to report child abuse. And if we don't, we could be fined or even, you know, even worse. So I think parents need to understand that. So that was something that I added to my handbook recently. Open door policy. You have to have an open door policy if you are a licensed child care provider. In my policy, parents are always allowed to come, but if they do come, I would like them to take their child with them because coming and going causes the child a lot of stress. So if you do come for a visit, you must take your child at that time. Earthquake kit, that's more for California people. Um, you know, you should have a list of your house rules. Damage, if you, you know, if children damage something, do you want them to replace it? You know, things like that, things like that. I think that is almost, yes. I think we can open it up to questions. Uh, I have my email address right here if anyone wants to email me directly. Is there a way I can go back to seeing more than, uh, all right, stop the screen sharing? So yeah, if you I stop the screen sharing, you'll come back just to us. Um, okay. If anybody has any questions, go ahead and drop it in the Q&A section um, and we can uh, answer them. Okay. If not, says they maybe you want to talk a bit just more about you know how you got to 
such a comprehensive. I know you said this took you 12 years to get. To it did. It did. That That's the thing about policies. Even if you have a five page policy handbook, that's fantastic because you can edit it every year. Things come up over and over and over again and keep a, a notepad or a piece of paper handy and write down if something happens that, you know, oh, I need to make a policy about that. That way, when you edit your policies, I do my edits in August for the new school year. Some people like to do everything in January for the new fiscal year, but it's important to leave yourself room to adjust and change and edit and modify because policies change over the years. Wonderful. Well, if nobody has any questions, then we can go ahead and uh, wrap this up. If okay. anybody has questions in the future, they have your email, they have our email, and this resource will be shared out with the recording to all. Yeah, the resource the really team. covers everything. It's it's a great resource Jessica did. Wonderful. Thank you very yeah, much. So put a lot of work into it, so can't take full credit for it, but and also, also obviously, like, there's so many of your policies in that resource, so it's a team effort for sure. And I thought your presentation was really great and very informative and comprehensive. So I'm sure I forgot a million things I wanted to say, but luckily I'm, they have the, uh, the resource and anyone can find me on social media or uh, through my email and ask me questions. I'd love to help you out. Well, thank you very much, Leslie, for joining. Thank you very much to everyone who worked hard to put this together. That resource is available to anyone who wants it. 70 pages with examples, both from Cesley and from ourselves. Um, that should give you plenty of material to make a very comprehensive uh, policy book to you know, make the best experience for your childcare. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Okay, bye.